Well, we, uh, I, I counted it up, I guess we did four weeks on chapter 24, and we'll be able to get through 25 tonight, it looks like. So, what? Yeah, it's because it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not quite the same, you know, kind of, there are two parables, actually there are three separate things that are dealt with here. And the first two of the sections are, like I say, they're parables, but they, um, they kind of go along with the idea of readiness. And the one thing that he does answer towards the end in the third of the sections uh, that we'll study tonight is really kind of something that you would only have a, an understanding of when you look back at it uh, through the eyes of, of the book of Revelation. We get a little bit more information about it, and it seems to be what, what he describes will be taking place at the time right about the close of chapter 19 before the beginning of chapter 20, somewhere thereabouts. So anyway, uh, with all of that, you know, kind of the, the background of it, the first two he will mention the kingdom of heaven is like. And so it's kind of a familiar phrasing that we've got from other places that Jesus had spoken about where he tries to give a parable of saying that this is what the kingdom is going to be like. But remember, as we, as we begin the study tonight, this is all being said based upon what we saw at the beginning of chapter 24. And it was when Jesus said that about the, the matters of his timing and uh, when will you return and what will be the signs. And so this whole discussion and his, his entire answer is based upon that. Now, before we go on, and uh, before we, we pray, the question gets asked, why do you spend so much time on this? Why does it matter? And here I, I, I would just simply answer it this way. When the disciples asked him, what will be the sign of your coming and when will these things take place? He could have said, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. Or give a brief answer with no distinction, no nothing. He goes on for two chapters to answer the question. So if it was important enough for him to go into this level of detail, and if it was important enough for him to answer the question and not just dismiss it, the fact that anybody should dismiss it, is, it just shows an awful lot about the mentality of the person that's dismissing it. All right? Because I did get the question asked, you know, boy, you're, you're really taking a lot of time. Yeah, because there's a lot to get your mind around, frankly. And, uh, and even tonight, I will say this, about the two parables, People with whom I agree on that Jesus will return and rapture the church before the tribulation and set up a millennial kingdom, we're totally agreed on matters of eschatology or end times things, can disagree on the, the people that are being spoken of. Is this a, a matter of the rapture or of the second coming? Is that what Jesus is talking about? And I do notice this. The more that you start to discuss and even disagree over those things, you miss the big picture, which is, are you ready? This is a matter of readiness. That's the issue. So we'll take a look at that, kind of an interesting way of him ending this discourse. And so that being the context, let's uh, turn to Matthew chapter 25. And you'll notice that as we conclude tonight, the abruptness of Jesus's transition from answering the question and the way that Matthew, you know, kind of gives us the rest of the detail, it happens very, very quickly. So uh, chapter 25, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we can gather in this place and we can come to your word and that you have told us that uh, if we'll seek after you, that, we'll, that you will be found. And as we, uh, as we seek you out for understanding in your word, we know, God, that your desire is to answer and to give us uh, reasons for what we believe and why we believe. And so we ask, Lord, that by your spirit you would make known your word to us and that we would make the proper application to what we read. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, I will say this in advance of the two parables, because a lot of times parables you'll find that, that Jesus is trying to give to them an understanding of a particular truth and oftentimes people will read so much into a parable that in a lot of cases just was never intended to be there and st so you start to come up with all kinds of odd things so again big picture this is a matter of readiness so very very common uh, of the ones that people like to look at of the parables dealing with eschatology is this first one 
So chapter 25, verse 1 is this. Notice the way it starts. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to. That's how that one reads. Now, we'll get to, to um, verse 14, the second of these, and look at how it begins. For the kingdom of heaven is like. They're both the exact same kind of a thing. Let me give you an analogy. Let me give you a, a way of looking at this as the kingdom of God is going to be like this. But you'll notice at verse 31, the third section of what we're looking at tonight, notice when he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. That's when you realize we're no longer dealing with parables. We're dealing with information that he's giving to us saying, when I return. Now he's speaking of himself in the, in the third person. So we go back to verse 1. So the kingdom of heaven will be likened to ten virgins. Sometimes you'll see it said as maidens. Now these would be the attendants to uh, a bride and the people. This is a little bit of an understanding of, of the, the whole process of marriage. It's not quite like what we have here, but it was a complete ceremonial thing, and it was a big, big deal. Actually, weddings were much more in the arranged kind of way, and so these were already predetermined, and so there was a, a whole formality to it that when the whole process was going to begun, or begin, would not be known to the, the, uh, the bride, but the bridegroom would go to retrieve his bride. And so you can do a lot of reading on, you know, like first century and, and traditions and all the rest of it, which helps you to understand why he's using this as an analogy. To us, it doesn't really, you know, necessarily mean the same things that it might mean to the ones that are hearing it. But the idea of when he's going to show up was something unknown to the bridal party who was awaiting, though they knew that the time was coming. So, they took their lamps and they went out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were wise and five were foolish. And see, here's one of those things where you can find in parables, people get so weird about this, and they start to think of them as every single bit of this needs to have a literal understanding and a literal interpretation. So I've seen people say, well, see right there, it says half the people are saved and half aren't. Really? You got all that from the parables, huh? All right. Well, so it says, now, those who were foolish took their lamps, and they took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And so this is the matter of preparation. So the ones with the oil, now see, again, the, the idea, can you spiritualize things, and does the oil represent the Holy Spirit? Yeah, you can make the case for that, but I, again, I don't want to ever go too far and read too much into it. The matter is one of preparation. Half of them were ready, half of them were not. Now, some people would look at this other part, this verse 5, and it says, but while the bridegroom was delayed, and they all slumbered and slept. Some people would look at that and say, well, see, this means that they weren't in a place of preparation. Well, um, you're going to find that at the end of this, uh, in verse 13, he says, no one knows the, the day or the hour. So nobody's going to stay up all the time. But the ones, they're all going to go to sleep. They all fell asleep in the anticipation because they didn't know the time. The difference was when the invitation came or when the, the, you know, the group came to make the announcements, the ones that went to sleep in preparation are completely separate from the ones who were not prepared for this. So once again, this is a matter of readiness. And so as the people in the church would read this, the exhortation that you take from it is that the church at all times should be ready. Now, people get into the disagreement. Is this being spoken to the church? Is it being spoken to to the Jews? Is it? He says the kingdom of heaven is like this. So if, if he's going to say the kingdom of heaven is like this, then anyone reading this should be able to take away from it the application of this. It's one of readiness. Now, who is the bridegroom other than Jesus? Of course that's who it is. Who's the bride? The bride is, is the one who he's coming to retrieve. Now, there are some that would say, this is a second coming passage. And others would say, no, this is a rapture passage. In either case, there is the, the matter of when he shows, what is your preparation? Are you ready to see him or are you not? Are you going to be in the category of the ones who had the lamps with oil trimmed or the ones who were out of those things? Let's read on the rest of this. And then we'll start to make some of those, you know, kind of, here's the two options. So we get this. Now, at midnight, a cry was heard, and behold, the bridegroom is coming, is what was said. So go out to meet him. 
Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. So the going to sleep with no preparation. That's the issue. At one point it appears that they all had some, but there wasn't enough left. So however long the delay, or however long it was from when they all were ready to when they're not now, there again, so much speculation. Here's the other thing that's very important to take from this, and it's a good way of Bible study. If the Bible does not say something explicitly, clearly, understandably, don't try to make it say something it doesn't say. This, again, is one of preparation. Now, in a little way of looking at this, I, I want to interject something. Now, I realize my view on this probably differs a bit from maybe the majority in that I do believe this speaks pretty well towards a rapture kind of a view, and here's why. When Jesus tells us in John 14 that he goes to prepare a place for us, that he would receive us to himself, my belief is that when he returns, now again, remember who was he saying that to in John chapter 14? The 11 disciples. Did any of those, when he says, I will come and receive you to myself, did they not all die and go to him? And yet he says, I will come and take you, receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. There's an action, and he comes to them. Now, I believe that that is, is something that is speaking of what will be the rapture of the church, and I do believe that he would come to retrieve the church before such a time as this. So it is the matter of all of those who have died before he has that you know, occasion of coming back to earth, are there with him and present. But this is speaking to a time, and Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like this. He's going to come and, and take uh, uh, this bride, if you will. It's, and he likens this whole event to like what a, a, a bridegroom comes for the bride. So again, midnight, notice what time it is. It's a time that was certainly know, known to the, the bridegroom and his entourage. They all know. They're the ones that are coming back. It's the ones that are being received that don't know of the time. Now, as we studied before, we have a pretty, pretty good idea of when the tribulation will be ended because it's three and a half years after the abomination of desolation. If you've been here, Jesus has already covered that in chapter 24. We know that he returns at the end of that. It's given to us. It's three and a half years, 1260 days. Uh, you know, a few different ways that it is described to us. So... Anybody who would be paying attention would certainly know when the end of the tribulation is going to happen because they have a sure date, the abomination of desolation, when, when the devil is being uh, worshipped as God in the temple. Start looking at your calendars three and a half years from that time, and you're at the end of the tribulation. So this idea that no one would have any idea of the matters, that is really not the case with the second coming, but it certainly is with the rapture. Now, again, much of the church doesn't even believe that there is a rapture. So when I think of that, I don't even consider those guys as of the same view that I have. Now, that puts me in with these other guys that would say, no, it's a second coming passage. And, you know, again, there's no sense in getting all worked up over it because whether it's second coming or the rapture, I believe it's the rapture. Ultimately, the matter is, are you even prepared? What is the readiness of your own heart and your own mind? Now, if it's a second coming thing, it's kind of an interesting thing because he's talking right past me in that matter because I won't be here for it. But still, the understanding of readiness is a very good one to carry at all times. So we read on. At midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. And then so we see the ones that had trimmed and those who had not. Now, the, in verse 9, it says, But the wise answered, and they said, no, lest there should not be enough for us and for you. So go rather and um, go to those who sell and then buy for yourself. Hurry up. Go get your own oil. If we give you ours, we won't be ready and you won't be ready either. No, there won't be enough. So hurry up and go get something for yourself. Now notice what it says. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. So again, if this is a rapture kind of a situation, we know that the following the tradition, if you will, the beginning, the wedding feast would begin at this 
point, and it would usually last as much as a week. And at the end of that week, there was then the presentation of the, the bride and the groom as, as married. Well, if you want to say that that is, is why he's using this specific example of saying what the kingdom of God is like, we also know that by looking at Revelation at 19, that's exactly what you would see. If what we see in Jesus, we certainly know that he is the one that's on the horse who comes back faithful and true, king of kings, lord of lords. We all agree on that. If it turns out that those who are in the white robes are the church, then that would be the presentation of the bride with the king as he returns. What would you would see at the end of a, of a wedding, whole process of the, the entire marriage feast, and at the culmination of it, the presentation of the bride and the groom. So he, he could have used so many different ways, so many different analogies, so many different parables of saying the kingdom of God is like, but he chose the wedding here, which, I, again, I find fascinating. It's curious to me. Now, if people come up and say, no, let me show you all the reasons why it's a second coming, I'm going to say, I'm not going to bother getting into an argument about it. It's just, you, there are too many good people who believe both sides of this, and if they can't get it straightened out, I'm not smart enough to get it straightened out. I'm just going by what I see here with other things that I see in the text. So it goes on. Now, Afterwards, the other virgins, the other maidens, came also, and they said, Lord, Lord, now open to us. But he answered to them and said, I never knew you. Um, or he said to them, Assuredly, I don't know you. Now, that's not uncommon because we know that in the other place. Uh, other places where Jesus is talking about, talked about this very same thing. Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do this? Did we not do that? And what did he say to them? I did not know you. This is a matter of relationship. Now, you can make the case for certain this in the rapture that only those who have a relationship with Jesus would be those who would be taken. It's for the church before he pours out wrath. And if you want to say if it's the people who have, have come to faith through the tribulation, had not yet been martyred, but will be there at his return those two would have a relationship with him and others would not. So, you know, you can find people on both sides would be able to point to that as an evidence of their side. Well, look at what he says in verse 12. But he said, Assuredly, uh, I say to you, I did not know you. Now, his, his um, way of kind of summarizing the whole thing is this. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And there's the important part. Watchfulness. Readiness. So whether this is, whether he's trying to explain this, because remember, as we've looked back on chapter 24, he has taken us through the whole litany of everything that would be the beginning of and running into the beginning of the tribulation. He gives us the day of the Lord. He gives us the abomination of desolation. He gives us a few different things and I believe what we had in the run-up at the end of chapter 24 was also speaking of the rapture. That's why it's easy for me to see the also transitions to this parable along those same lines. Because remember, Jesus didn't just, when he was saying these things, he didn't say what he said in chapter 24. He says, now let me move on to chapter 25. It was a continuing discussion that he was having. It was a continuing answer to a question. So, the second of these parables... He says to them, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who has called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Now, some people would look at this and, and say this is speaking specifically to the church. Now, you'll find that I, as we go through it, I'm, I'm a little, I have some discomfort in that and, and I'll explain why. The talents in this case are, are of a monetary sense. And so some people would look at this and say, see, here Jesus is speaking to the church about things that he has given giftings to the church and all the rest. I have a problem with that because of the way that this ends up. You can more, I believe, make the case that the talents are, are a bit better represented by that the gospel has gone out. Here Jesus is the one speaking. And we know that from the moment that he came into this creation, he was at that point even in his infancy, beginning to fulfill prophecy. They were told he was coming and he would fit a certain criteria. 
Now he comes out in his, you know, right around his 30th birthday, somewhere there around, right around the age of 30, and he begins to speak. And he's teaching, and he's showing things that have never been seen before. He is saying things that are elaborating on so much of what the Old Testament was saying, and now he is introducing the people to the God of heaven directly. And those are the things like when he would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said that to Philip in chapter 14 of John. And so the idea that there was something that was completely brand new in him, and now the relationship that God would have with the world because of him, then you can say, could that be what the talents are that are being spoken of here? Because it's not a monetary thing. He's using it. Remember, it's a parable. A parable is a story, or, or call it whatever you want, a story type thing, but it is to illustrate or explain a spiritual truth. So in this case, if, if we take it that Jesus represents a brand new way of relationship to God, I, gr I agree with that. And then he's able to say he comes to people and he presents himself that way. Again, in the overall context is chapter 24. When will these things happen? The, the you know, breaking down of the, of the uh, temple. And what are going to be the signs of your coming? Now he's culminating this with two parables. So, the talents. Traveling to a far country. Who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And so it says, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, one to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on his journey. So again, in the first couple of verses you have this. Jesus, is he the one who is being spoken of here? Does he go away on a journey? Okay, if you're going to take it as the rapture kind of a thing, which I, I, this is where I start to have a problem with it, because at the rapture he doesn't come back to his servants just to cast one out. The church is, is when he comes back, he's taking the whole of the church. But he goes away for a time. Now it says, in verse 16, Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received the two gained two more. But he who had received one went and dug it in the ground, and he hid the Lord's money. Now, after a long time, the Lord of the servants came and settled the accounts with them. Now we kind of see where this is going. And it does have a similar kind of a, a sound to it as what we saw in the first of the kingdom parables. So there are a variety of ways of looking at this. Why is it that, he's, that he talks about it as being a long time that he's gone? Is this more looking at the potential of it being a second coming kind of a situation? You can make probably a better case for that. And the reason why that would be is that he's gone away and even in a time of judgment, the people that he has given this information to, what have they done with what they've heard, these talents? Again, what are they represented by? And here's why it gets so weird. So many different ways that you can take this. And parables tend to be, on, in some occasions, a little on the ambiguous side. And fortunately, oftentimes, we'll get the interpretation of parables. Jesus will teach a parable and then tell you what it means. Now, in these ones, he doesn't. He doesn't, but he says the kingdom of God is like this. So we see in verse, um, uh, verse 20, So he who had received the five talents came and bought five, or brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. So you see the beginning of this. There is a fruitfulness in what was left in the care and the stewardship of one person and so it, it multiplied. There was something that came of benefit from it. And so we see in verse 21, And so the Lord had said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now that's going to be repeated. But we can take away, here are the things that we absolutely know. Whatever it is that he had given to them, in the analogy that we have here, was something that they were faithful to what they were given. And when given account for it, they came to the Lord and said, what you gave me, I have used it, and fruit has been born from it. If we look at this as kind of Jesus came, brought the message of the gospel, and left for a time when he returned, what did he find? So people would look at that and say, this, this would fit in the, in the rapture scenario well. Then others would say, well, but at the same, by the same token, 
his leaving for a while, even during the tribulation, he's still not back, but he comes back at the end of that. Now, what happens to those people who had gone through the tribulation? Well, they've had, the, we looked at them, they had the angels, they had the two prophets, they certainly had the 144,000 that are all proclaiming the good news, and there are those who would come through the tribulation not yet martyred, but also not having bowed the knee. How does that all work out? Pretty hard to say. We don't get the details in the Bible. How many people will be able to hide in the mountains or whatever else and, you know, survive for three and a half years, not, you know, succumbing to the things taking place and taking the mark and all that stuff? I don't know. The, t the scripture doesn't tell us any of those details, so it is all left to speculation. So let me pause for a moment. Whether you want to look at this as a second coming or as a rapture verse, again, you're going to be able to find what you want to find in this. In both cases, readiness is the issue. So if readiness is the issue as far as the church is concerned, I believe that when the Lord comes back for the church, that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 passage or 1 Corinthians 15 or John 14 when Jesus receives the church, at that time, as far as I'm concerned, that is the end of all the things down here on earth. And if, it, if there is something going on in the tribulation, it's not my concern. I won't be here to see it. It's not my future. So, as you read on through the rest of this, let's do the, the other two guys here. Verse 22, uh, He also who had received the two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So, the last of them. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered, and I was afraid. Now, I don't think of God as angry. I don't think of him as being hard. I don't think of him as being, you know, uh, reaping where he didn't sow. Everything is the, well, the, the psalm says, uh, everything is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, all things. So it's not as though there are some things that don't belong to him, and he ended up getting something out of them. So you can see the analogy or the parable is not supposed to be entirely exact, but rather to catch the mentality of the people who had been given or entrusted with something. That's the issue. Now, for whatever reason, these, this one person talks about fearfulness. I didn't want to have to face you if I squandered what you had given. We don't get that from the other guys. We didn't get that from those guys of saying, well, we were afraid that if we didn't do something with it, so we risked it, and fortunately it all worked out for us. It wasn't one of those kind of situations. They just said, this is what's been given to us. We're going to bear fruit with it. Well, this person here never even gave it a try. Notice what he says to this person. So the Lord answered to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Wow. So you can go ahead and play all this fear game that you want to. Your problem is laziness. Your problem is that you didn't want to do anything with this. You found other reasons, and you're trying to excuse it away on, well, I knew that you were kind of like this, and I was afraid of you. It's funny because I do get those conversations, and I'm sure that you too, you do too. Isn't it funny that the people who want nothing to do with God seem to be the biggest experts on who he is and what he's about? Isn't that funny? They'll tell you everything that there is to know about God. Of course, they're never correct. They just spout off whatever they've heard before. But all of a sudden, they become Bible scholars when they want to tell you why they don't believe in God. Right? You ever notice that? Okay. Yeah, I find it kind of comical. Well... Verse 27, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. Well, it's, I'm sorry, I didn't read all of verse 26. But the Lord answered and he said to him, you wicked and you lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and I gather where I have not scattered seed. You ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and then at my coming I would have at least rece received back um, my own with interest. So... You could have done at least something with it. The idea of burying it is your own laziness. You could have put it in the bank. At least there had been some interest to it. But rather than it being a matter of, well, how much did you produce, that's not the, the focus of the parable. The focus of the parable is the preparation and the heart and the mind and the readiness of the people who were given these talents. 
did they see what it was as valuable and then want to give account when the person came back to receive it? That's the issue. Well, in verse 29, for everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have abundance. Now notice that doesn't sound like a hard, austere, reaping where you don't sow. It doesn't sound like this mean person that this guy was talking about being afraid of. But from him who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. And cast, and, uh, and cast out the uh, unprofitable rather servant into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that is a common phrase, too. We see it throughout the Bible. And the weeping and gnashing of teeth is, yeah, it's a matter of kind of anguish and torment. And the reason for the anguish and the torment is partially due to their understanding of their loss and what they could have had but do not have. And the agony would be as much from physical torment as it is from, from knowing in a spiritual sense what was, what was squandered. So that is the two of the parables the kingdom of God is like. Now, notice the actual change in direction at this point. Because now he's no longer saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. Now he makes it very clear that he is talking about his return. Now, when the question was asked, what will be the signs of your return? He's given us those mainly in chapter 24. And also, in the last two parables, is a matter of readiness before these events. This, verse 31, is clearly speaking of day of the Lord stuff. I am of the opinion that chapter 24 gives us a little bit of both. It gives us the things that are the run-up into the tribulation. The abomination of desolation, desolation is clearly in the middle. And then the day of the Lord is clearly at the end. That is very easy for us to understand. Now he's going to deal with the day of the Lord when he comes back in that day of reckoning. Now we've already studied a lot of passages on this. Remember the seven years is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble from, uh, from Daniel chapter 9 and from a number, a number of other places. Um, Jeremiah talks about it and of course you get a lot of detail. I don't know how many of you did, but if you went back and read Zechariah from chapter 12, 13, and 14, there's tons of information on this. Joel, we looked at it last week. Joel chapter 2, also quoted by Peter in Acts chapter 2. Day of the Lord stuff. We heard all about that last week. This is the same kind of stuff. Now, what you will notice, the things that are spoken of in those other passages, it takes until John's time, until we start to get from the book of Revelation an understanding of where these might fit in their chronology. So if you were to go ahead and study in chapter 19 of the book of Revelation you will notice that there is the unveiling of the Lord, and I think it's around verse 11 is where that kind of starts. It goes on to the time when he's going to make war with the enemies, the armies that come against him, and they're crushed. But it doesn't fit what we're reading here that they're part of those armies. This seems to be a distinct group of people, ones that were not engaged in the battle, and yet there are still people there at the time. Now we know at the end of the thousand years, have you ever asked yourself the question, if, if he comes back and everyone is judged, then how did the world get populated again that the devil could come back at the end of a thousand years and, and you know, start a whole brand new army of, of people to oppose him? You ever ask the question? Are you even awake? <laughs> Got one that's not. So if, you, if you've never asked the question, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because the, the people that when he returns, he's the judge. So what happens to the rest? I mean, how do they get in there? Well, the people that have been saved, there is a, there's an interesting, you know, again, we don't have a lot of details on it, but there is a, a normal kind of a life that goes on in those thousand years from best we can tell because somehow, some way, people begin to inhabit the earth again. And there is a judgment that comes at the end of that because the final judgment does not come until the end of the thousand years, not the beginning. When Jesus returns in chapter 19, he makes war against an army. But he does separate groups of, into judgment. If we understand all of that, it sure seems as though those who had been faithful to him must repopulate and have children and all the rest of that and generations follow and at the end of the thousand years some of those of their own will will rebel. I don't know how else you figure it in. 
So is, does all that make sense? And we'll go to Revelation in just a moment. So chapter 25, verse 31 says this. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So chapter 19, where he begins to set up and rule the nations and all the rest of that. You can read about it. Now it says, now all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Now, we'll read the rest of that in just a moment. When he returns to the earth, again, what we know, and, you know, let's go ahead and do it. We might, we're going to get there eventually. Let's just get our hands on chapter 19 of Revelation. And as I said earlier, Revelation is really the only of the books that give details about the stuff that Jesus is talking about in this section of Matthew in his Olivet Discourse. So when he gives those details, let's just go ahead and read the whole thing as it kind of lays out. Um, starting at verse 7, it says, Let us rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. Um, and it was uh, to her granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, and the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true and faithful sayings. Now, in this time, this is before his coming to the earth, but there is something that is taking place in heaven. And so this idea of the bride being gathered together and that this feast is prepared, here's a question that is very important. What about the believers that would be on the earth? So are they not part of that bride? If we're told that the church is going through the, the tribulation as we hear all the time some, from some, some say you go all the way through it, well then how is he marrying half of his bride? Because they're the ones assembled in heaven and if they're all still, some are still here on earth, how does that work out? Just an argument against. So, these acts of the saints and the clothing that is upon them and all the rest of it, you'll see there, blessed are those who are called. And so then notice he says, and so I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit, it's the intent, prophecy. Now, in verse 11, you get this. So then I saw, now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is what he does when he first comes back. Notice what it says. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except for himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, the Logos. Same thing that we get from John chapter 1. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. I think that makes perfect sense that that's what we looked at at the earlier part of the chapter, where the church is arrayed in those garments. Now, it says... Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he would strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name that is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which helps you to understand it's because he does this in this way of battle. We're not even involved with it. So, notice in verse 17, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of the heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and those who sit upon them, and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on, uh, on the horse, 
and against his army, those people that would come. Now, as we read through this, does it sound like anything that we've read in chapter 24 so far about goats and sheep? These ones on that side and these ones on that side. What we have here is armies gathered, not people. And this is happening at a very specific place. This is then happening in Armageddon, okay, in that valley. Verse 20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So that sounds like the entire engagement there is finished. There's nothing left of those people, right? Can we agree? At this battle, when he comes back, it's final there in that battle. Well, then, who's being spoken about here in chapter 25? Because there's still people. He says, when I come back, we've read everything about when he comes back. Because by the time that you get to chapter 20, then you're, you're starting to get into, you know, forever kingdom stuff. You get it? So, at some interval of time, what Jesus is talking about here, of these people, it has to happen somewhere between, you know, at the, at the end of chapter 19, after he comes back and that whole thing happens and... You know, he steps foot on the Mount of Olives. Really, remember when it says that he steps on the Mount of Olives and then, you know, he's going to be entering back into the temple and all that stuff and it splits in half? Um, that's after he's taking care of what happens there in Armageddon to the north. So then he comes back, Mount of Olives, splits in half, all that stuff begins to take place. Now that seems to be about where this would start to fit in. So back to Matthew 25. And so he says um, in verse 36, finishing up with that, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And so the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you, uh, um, see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Now, Here's where there gets to be an interesting bit of speculation at this point. When did this take place? Because you're going to notice that he is talking about another group of people, or so it would appear, because there are sheep and goats, right? Goats are the unbelievers. Sheep are the believers in this case. There are those who would say that he is speaking to the Gentile nations, and he's going to deal with how they treated the Jewish people during that time of the tribulation. That's one, there was one person in particular, I believe, is, uh, I believe John Walvoord holds this view, and I didn't look at who else does. But it's kind of an intriguing thing, because the focus of the, um, uh, the, the devil's anger and, and fierceness is directed at the Gentiles as much as, or uh, the, the Jews as much as anyone, more so. Because all of this takes place in Jerusalem, right? And then the outlying areas, of course. But the focus is Israel and Jerusalem in particular. Well, so the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did so to me. So those brethren could be only one of two groups of people. It could only be the other sheep, in addition to the ones that were asking the question, when did we do this? Well, when you took care of one another. Or if those sheep are representative of Gentiles, for those of you who took in my brethren, because obviously Jesus, being Jewish, would be able to make that reference. And there is a kind of an interesting historical precedent to this when you think of what had happened during World War II. So, interesting. You know, with the, it's just, it's a fascinating thing. Again, there is no way to be dogmatic about any of this. You can't, because it's not in the text. It doesn't tell you. You just have to say, interesting possibility. And if you've noticed, I have not tried to say absolutely this is what it means, because I couldn't say such a thing. I could tell you the which way I lean, but I can tell you that there are other views of this as well. And again, what you get in this, readiness, preparation, and being aware of your times. Well, in verse 41, it tells us, 
Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, there is again this question, and it, it is an important one that we should answer when it's asked of us. And here's a, a, a one of those great passages to remind you. When people will come to you and say, well, you're trying to tell me what you believe about Jesus. If I don't believe like you, then I'm going to hell. And how many of us have had that one thrown in our face? And how often do you go, man, how do you answer that? That's a difficult one. So you're saying, well, if we're going to be totally honest with them, and I try to be, <laughs> you just got to try to say it in a way that doesn't sound like you're in any way pleased at the prospect of this happening. And, you know, in fact, let me, um, let me be very, very careful about that. There is no joy, not a bit, in knowing that anyone will be separated from a loving God for eternity. That is, that is beyond tragic. In fact, there are not words to describe the sadness that that should bring to every believer. We would never want to be in a place of rejoicing over the death of anyone, no matter how horrible they are. And we see people all the time who, who are just so filled with hatred and rage towards God. Do I rejoice over the atheist that dies and goes to see God face to face as his judge? Not hardly. Not hardly. I find no, ple no pleasure in that whatsoever. So when I read these kind of things, I think the human toll and the human cost is just, it's incalculable. So when you talk to those people who say, so you're telling me, first of all, you want to say, it's not me telling you. Actually, I'm, I am telling you what God says, and it's not what he would want for you. But you just need to know that that place that we call hell was never made for people, because you have it right here. Then you will, he will say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for who? The devil and his angels. That's who is supposed to be in there. The other people who go there go because they have decided to go there, because of their rejection. And because of the weakness of their argument, they will say, So you're telling me that there's no other way? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm telling you, because that's what Jesus said. And oh, by the way, if you want to throw in another layer to this thing, take a look where Jesus says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know that, verse 16, but verse 17 is the one that tells us that I did not come into this world to condemn it, but that through me it might be saved. And then the next verse is where he says, because the world's going that way anyhow. It's already condemned because it doesn't believe. So for anyone that you're having this discussion with, look, you don't have to believe anything. You're already in that direction. I'm not telling you anything. It's not that you would reject him, or it's not that you're, you're not listening to what I would say that's going to send you. You're already going there. What I'm telling you could change your course. And just know that God never intended for you to be there. That was made for the rebellious devil and his angels. Now, if you wind up with them there, you do so eyes wide open. So... Verse 42. So he's going to say to them, depart. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Now here's an interesting thing. You will find churches very involved in doing these things. And I'm glad that they do. It's a good thing. But that does not make a church a church. People do those things because of their own gratitude towards the Lord Jesus Christ for what he has done for them. And the only reason they would ever think of going into another part of the world and doing these things is to demonstrate the love of Jesus because these things will not save you. Okay, we already understand. By the time that Jesus is talking about this, he's already referred to these people who would reject his gift of his free gift of salvation, that without that, that they would die in their sin. So you're not going to work your way to heaven. People try to use this verse to say, look, if we just do this, if we feed people and we give them housing and we do this, that, and the other thing, then, then we're cool. Because right here, Jesus says those ones who did that. Well, if that's the case, then you've got to explain to verse 26 to me where he says, I'm going to go get crucified. There would be no reason for that. Galatians tells us that. If righteousness came by the law or by actions or by works, then Jesus died in vain. Right? So, he says, verse 44 again, Then 
uh, they also will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? We never saw you. And so this is the total opposite of what he had said to the other people. Then he will answer and say, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to, the, uh, to one of the least of these, you did not do so to me. That idea that any of our works would be an, a, a perfect, pure example of the relationship that we have with him. Because again, this whole thing, both of these kingdom passages that we talk about are all about relationship. It's about with the talents, it's those things that he had given and there were those that were ready for him when he came back, or if it's the ten uh, maidens, virgins, same thing. When he showed up, great, we are prepared, we're ready for him, we're in a place of readiness. So in this case, once again, these people were not in a place of desiring and wondering, they weren't waiting for him, they were not showing fruit, they were doing none of, such, none of those things. Verse 46, these ones will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into everlasting life. So when we read verses 31 to 46, what we always want to try to do, again, since it's not a parable, he's not using it as an analogy of some sort. He's not trying to liken it to it. It's like this. In this case, when I return, here is what it's going to be like. Great. So we have that scenario. We have 31 to 46. Where does it fit in that in that? time frame that we already have laid out for us in Revelation. Right about end of 19 at the beginning of chapter 20. Before, the cha before chapter 20. Um, you know what I didn't read in Revelation. Let's go back there for a second. Because why do I say it has to happen at the end of 19? Because we see this. Verse 1 of chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So by chapter 20 is already the beginning of the millennium. And we see, and he cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him that he should receive, or he should deceive the nations uh, no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little time. So clearly what we just read in chapter 24 happens before that. Now, you good Bible scholarly students may say to me, well, so the ones then that are judged, how does that work out? Because there's that great white throne thing. And I would say, great question. That's what you see in verse 11 of chapter 20. That's when he saw a great white throne, and he who sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And so then I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were open, and another book was open, uh, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works, whether they were even in that book. So where do they go for that time of that thousand years? They are held, and then they are resurrected yet again at the end of a thousand years. That's when they go into that eternal punishment. So does that answer the question? You all look very puzzled. I don't want that to be the case. When you look, once again, and I know that, that this stuff really comes you know, fast at you, and, and trust me, um, when you're teaching these things, it's because, just remember, I've read this and I've studied it and heard other people do studies on it. I've heard it so many times. If this is new to you and you never studied through this part before, once again, you can go back to it tonight. Or you can do it in the morning or whenever you want to. Read verses 31 to 46 and say, great, when does it fit? Remember, you're going to start Revelation 19. It has to happen before the beginning of chapter 20. It fits somewhere, somewhere thereabouts. And then you can also know how it finally ends up by starting at verse 11 of chapter 20. That's at the end of the thousand years. And you'll notice that he, he even puts death to death. Hell, the grave, all of it gets cast into the lake of fire. That means that it's done, it's finished, and it's over with. Interestingly enough, Paul saw that, by the way. 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about that. You think that's only a revelation thing. So there's, there's your little hint. I'll tell you that it comes after verse 20. See if you can find it. 
1 Corinthians 15, somewhere after verse 20. I'm not going to tell you right where it starts. It's after that. You tell me what you find. So I, I'd like to throw these little things out to you every once in a while. And then you can come back to me and say, oh, I see it. I see it. That idea of death and the grave and all that stuff. Even death is put to death. Try to wrap your mind around that one. Nobody will ever die again. No sickness, no nothing. None of that stuff. It's gone. How cool is that? All right. When we get to chapter 26, you'll see this just next week when we get together. You'll see it says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things that he said to the disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Kick that one around for a moment. These guys have just heard about his return and everything else, and within a moment, he says, two more days, Passover's coming. I'll be crucified. Immediately transfers, or, or it, it immediately transitions, rather, in verse 3, so the chief priests and the scribes, the elders, and the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas. By the way, we visit that in Israel. Caiaphas's house. They plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Isn't it amazing how you go from chapter 24 to 25 to that? Wow. I will say this one last thing, and I am always intrigued by this. When we come up around the time of the triumphal entry and Easter and all of those things, whenever that comes around each year, I'm always fascinated to go back and, and see how much of the Gospels are dedicated towards the last week and more importantly really the, out, the last hours of his life and you would ask yourself he knows what he's got coming right he says two days from now is the Passover and I'm gonna be crucified so it's not wrong place wrong time if only he had known no he knew that but what was he doing with his time I got a lot of things to tell you guys because the time is short and you're gonna be picking it up and carrying it on from here, let me talk with you. And so he poured himself into mind-blowing. Let's stand, and I see Ed's here, so we'll close with a song. And let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for gathering us yet again in this place and for us being able to come to your word and, and the teaching of parables. So much that is in here that is implied, so much in here that we can maybe speculate on, but the big picture that way of being ready, prepared, always waiting for that and with the expectation that we might see you. God, I pray for each one of us who are here that we would just in a place, uh, always be in a place of examining our own lives. Are we prepared? What is our life like? Are we encumbered with the things of this world or are we looking for the one that is to come? God, if there's anything in any of us that you would like to clean away, that our eyes would be open, that we would be at all times in a place of readiness and preparation, then I pray, God, you would strip those things away. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for the comfort that comes from, from the, uh, the teaching of it, that you have taught the disciples. They have passed this along to us, and we may learn how we thank you. We give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Messiah, my Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock, my redeemer, there is power in your name, in your name. walk on the waters, you speak to the sea, you stand in the fire beside me, you roar like a lion, you bled as a lamb, you carry my healing in your hands, God, you walk on the waters, you speak to the sea, you stand in the fire me. You roar like a lion, you bled as a lamb, you carry my healing in your hands. Jesus, there is none like you, Jesus. 
There is none like you, Jesus. Good night. God bless you. Stay and pray.